Follow the star to a place unexpected Would you believe after all we projected A child and a manger Lowly and small, weakest of all Unlikeliest hero, wrapped in his mother Sure just a child, is this who we pray? great to have you guys here today. Only one God has ever done that for us, and that's what the Christmas season is all about, that God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us, to make a way for us to be saved uh, then and now for sins that he didn't commit, but we commit all the time. That's what Christmas is about, the hope we find in Jesus Christ. Today, we're going to continue with our Christmas lesson series called Socks and Underwear. Trevor preached the first sermon last weekend, and Jamie is back uh, to preach the second lesson this week, and it's all about if Jesus Christ is really the greatest gift, which he is, then why would anybody reject that gift? It's a really great lesson. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing it again, and I'm looking forward to you hearing it as well. But before we get there, why don't you stand up, and let's uh, do what, what we should be doing all along, what we should be doing all the time, but especially in the Christmas season. Sing, oh, come, let us adore.
this morning is to adore the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who made a way for us to be saved. To water you turn into wine. up in you as you say.
great day. We've had an enthusiastic crowd. We've had a, about over 160 volunteers today to help us. The meal is going very smooth. The go meals have been up and the deliveries. So far we're having a fantastic year. Thanksgiving dinner 2019 has been really a big success here at Central. Hundreds of people have uh, gotten meals to eat here and hundreds of people have gotten meals delivered to their home. We do this to help people know that we care about people and to help them to enjoy Thanksgiving. The people that eat here sit and talk to one another. They enjoy each other. There, there's fellowship that really takes place and, uh, and God's love is being shared by the members of Central Christian Church as they sit and talk to them and serve them. We are thankful for this ministry and it's still going on and it's alive and well and God is doing great things through the love ministry that Central is giving to the community around us. I'm just so grateful to be a part of a church family that just the simple act of a warm meal is such a great thing and an excellent thing to do in this community. So thank you, thank you, thank you to all of the hundreds of volunteers that came forward, did a great job for the thousands, oh, up, uh, close to 2,000 people that came through these doors to get a warm meal and say, hey, God loves you. This event has gone on in the community for over 20 years because every year God pours himself into it. And it's amazing that when he does that, people can come into these doors just to know that they are loved and they are cared for. 
Your generosity makes this happen every year, and I'm so glad to be a part of this church with you all. Our volunteers will now come forward with the orange buckets, and they'll collect our tithes and our offerings. And yet another way that your generosity brings hope to people is through our Change for a Dollar ministry. Now, James, he shared with us last weekend how our Change for a Dollar ministry throughout the month of December is a little different than what we've done in the past. Each weekend, we share with you those that were helping and those struggles and those needs that they have. But this weekend, we're not going to do that. We're not even going to tell you who your cha our Change for a Dollar recipient is. But what we will share with you is that our Change for a Dollar this weekend and for throughout December is all about giving hope to people. Hope. Here's the plan. We ask that you give an extra dollar, and then during our Christmas services, we will announce and share with you our Change for a Dollar recipient. So right now, give in faith, knowing that you're giving an extra dollar and you are giving hope to people. Just like a present, you gotta put it under the Christmas tree and you gotta wait to see what it's gonna be. So let's stretch ourselves and witness together what God can do when we come together in His name. And in just a minute, our volunteers, they'll come back out and they'll pass you communion. Here at Central, we have open communion. So everyone is invited to join in together. You'll be passed the double stack cup. And in that cup, you'll find juice and bread. Take that out, sit and reflect. Because that bread, it represents Jesus' body broken for us. And the juice, it represents his blood shed for us. Don't you just love the name of this Christmas series, <laughs> Socks and Underwear? It's a very corny title, but man, is it true. God always gives us what we need, not necessarily what we ask him for. Because can you imagine if God gave us everything that we asked him for? The Cubs would win the World Series every single week, every single year. The Christmas season, we're also looking toward hope. My prayer is that everything that we do around here at Central brings hope to people. That's why we cook a warm meal on Thanksgiving. That's why we throw thousands of lights out in the atrium and outside. And that's why we invite thousands of people to come into these doors for Christmas at Central. Because hopefully and maybe through it all, God can display his mighty love and display hope. The gift of hope, the gift of Jesus. When we celebrate Christmas, when we come together right now to celebrate communion, we are celebrating God putting on the flesh of an infant and becoming one of us. And not only did he become one of us, he came with us, but he came for us. Emmanuel, God with us. As we celebrate communion, Jesus' death and his resurrection, everyone is invited to share in together. You have a God that loves you and cares for you and is here for you. You are not alone. Our Heavenly Father knows what we need and he does what's best for us. So let's celebrate that together, Emmanuel, God with us. Let's celebrate that we have the perfect gift at just the perfect time. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you that you gave us the perfect gift at the perfect time when you knew we needed it the most. God, may we look towards you this Christmas season and be of joy and of hope so that others are so attracted to you through the lives that we lead. God, give us hope, give us joy. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
praise the Lord together. is the Central Minute. In the next 60 seconds, you'll find out what's going on at Central now. Jingle Jam is back. Kick off the Christmas season at Central with a party big enough for the whole family. Jingle Jam is presented by our Kid Depot and Student Ministries and is this Sunday night, December 8th at 6 p.m. in the Worship Center. Join us for hot chocolate, cookies, holiday pictures, and a unique take on the Christmas story like you've never seen before. Speaking of Christmas, mark your calendars now for Christmas at Central. Let's celebrate the greatest gift of all time, the gift of hope. Services are four nights, Friday, December 20th through Monday, December 23rd at 6 and 8 p.m. each night. Grab some invite cards in the atrium today. You can be a part of making Christmas at Central incredible. From greeting, serving, transportation, and everything in between, it takes a big crew. If you and your family would like to help for an evening or two, stop by the parlor after a service this weekend and our journey pastor will get you connected. And lastly, join the Kept Sisterhood for seven weeks with the 2020 Bible Study by Christine Kane. The study starts Monday, January 6th, and you can sign up at centralnow.com kept or in the atrium. 60 seconds is up. Missed a date or need more info? Start at centralnow.com or stop at the information desk. Now, here's Senior Pastor Jamie Allen with our Christmas series, Socks and Underwear. Well, thank you, Alicia. Uh, get your Bibles ready. You're also going to need lesson notes online. Look for the notes tab on site here in the room. Raise your hands real high and we'll bring you lesson notes. Hello. Oh, you're, you're here because it's tonight, right? That's, that's right, that's right. Ten, no, thank you. Uh, six o'clock tonight, Jingle Jam, right here in this room. This guy is going to be part of it. It's going to be a great evening. Our middle schoolers, our high schoolers, you're going to enjoy Jingle Jam. Please come back tonight at six o'clock. That's what all these presents are for. That's decoration for tonight. That's going to all be gone, I guess, after tonight. Thank you, Bear. We can't bear you being up here anymore. So, <clears throat> last service... Last service, he was late getting the TV up here, so I said, uh, why the big pause? And he said, I don't know, I was just born with him. Um, well, we're glad you're worshiping with us. Uh, we want you to get those notes ready and uh, get ready to stay focused today. Once upon a time, there was a king. And this king was richer and more powerful than any king before or since. Despite his wealth and his power, this king had a reputation of being kind, merciful, and just. He had everything except what he wanted most. He wanted to be married. He wanted love. Now, the problem was not a lack of opportunity. Plenty of women in the kingdom wanted to be the queen. But this king was concerned. If he found the right woman, how would he know she was marrying him for love and not just because he was the king. He wasn't sure what to do, but he knew more than anything else, he wanted to be married. And he wanted to do more than just share his palace and his wealth, he wanted to share his heart. One day in the city, he saw a simple peasant woman. Nothing about her really should have caught his eye, but she caught his eye. He watched her for several days and soon realized he was falling in love with her. Why he should love her is hard to explain. She had no special connections, no political influence. It seemed she had nothing to offer him. But he loved her just the same. How could he show his love for her? He asked his advisors and they said, well, just command her to love you. You're the king. She is powerless to resist you. You can just take away her freedom to choose. But this king was very wise and he knew he could force her to live in the palace, but he could not force her to love him. 
The advisors suggested he find someone else, someone worthy, someone of noble standing to love. Well, he searched, months passed, but he just couldn't stop thinking about this simple peasant woman. He decided the best way to win her heart was to shower her with gifts. She was hungry and dirty, and the king knew with just the snap of his fingers, he could take care of all of her needs, give her anything she desired. But how would he know if she loved him for him or for the gifts he'd given her? Finally, he realized there was only one way. So one day, this king rose from his throne, laid aside his scepter, took off his crown and his royal robes. He left the palace and he lived in the streets. He scratched out a living, begged for food. The king became as ragged as the one he loved. It was the only way. It was the only way. In the Bible, the book of John tells us about a king. John 1, 1 to 3. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him and nothing was created except through Him. The king was in his palace. Luke 2, 6 and 7. The time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. The king became as ragged as the ones he loved. It was the only way. It was the only way. And folks, this is the gift we celebrate at Christmas. God became flesh. God gives us this great gift out of his great love for us. He comes to earth because he did not want to live without our love. But this great gift of Christmas, you all know, it's not often warmly received. Trevor talked last weekend about Christmas presents we don't get excited about, Christmas presents we don't really want. Those gifts are kind of like socks and underwear. Nobody really wants socks and underwear for Christmas. But we do need them, and they serve a purpose. I read this last week about a woman who received a year's supply of Nutrisystem food for Christmas from her mother-in-law. <laughs> Merry Christmas. I bet Christmas dinner in that house was a real blast, don't you? We've all been given presents we don't really need, we don't really want. We'd just soon return them as, as keep them. Matter of fact, the experts say that everybody will return at least one gift this year, or some of us will re-gift it. Well, the same thing happened at Jesus' birth. He is the perfect gift, a very expensive gift. God sent his only son. Jesus left heaven, he came to earth, he left his throne to live among us. There has never been a gift like him. But most people rejected him. John 1, verses 10 and 11, he came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. The world didn't pay much attention to him, this gift was given, but rejected. It was returned. Now, I do believe Christmas is a time when people tend to be more accepting of Jesus. But sometimes I think it's because our world likes the Christmas Jesus. There's something comfortable and easy about Christmas Jesus. They're more open to, to Jesus because he's a baby. A baby's not very threatening, can't put any real demands on us. Christmas Jesus is just a baby in a manger. But Christmas Jesus becomes crucified Jesus. Isaiah 53, verse 3, He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief, 
We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Why was he despised and rejected? Why did people not receive Jesus? He is the perfect gift. Why was he, why is he rejected by so many people? I want you to fill in some blanks on your notes, okay? Some people reject Jesus because of his message. Some people reject Jesus because of his message. In the Bible, most people were okay with Christmas Jesus, and of course, people loved miracle Jesus. But when Jesus became preaching Jesus, a lot of people went home. John chapter 6 tells us Jesus fed 5,000 people with just a small lunch. The next day, the crowds were even bigger. They wanted Jesus to feed them breakfast. He refused, telling them, I'm not a bread messiah, I... I didn't come to fill your stomachs. I'm a spiritual Messiah to fill your hearts. I'm the bread of life from heaven. The Bible says when they heard this, the people started to complain. John 6, 66 and 67. At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the 12 and asked, are you also going to leave? Now, from that group of over 5,000 people, only about 120 had the depth to stay with Jesus to the end. People were offended by his message. They were comfortable with him as a baby. They love his miracles, and they love when he feeds them, but they don't like his message. You know people still reject Jesus today because they don't like his message. They don't like it when he says, love and pray for your enemies. They don't like Jesus saying, you cannot serve both God and money. They don't like it when Jesus says, if you refuse to forgive others, your Father in heaven will not forgive your sins. They don't like it when Jesus says, do to others what you would want them to do to you. They don't like it when Jesus says, do not commit adultery, don't even look and lust. Some people reject Jesus because of his message. Next blank, some people reject Jesus because believing in him means rejecting someone else. Some people reject Jesus because believing in him means rejecting someone else. And when you get the blank filled in, I want you to look at John 12, 42 and 43. Many people did believe in him, that's in Jesus, however, including some of the Jewish leaders. But they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than the praise of God. They believed, but they didn't receive because they cared more about what people thought than about what God thought. Still happens today. People believe in Jesus, but they just can't quite admit it. They won't give him their life and be baptized. They won't become a Christian because they're afraid of what someone will say. Well, what would my friends from college say? What would my friends at work think if I started going to church on the weekends? They reject Jesus because they're afraid of being rejected by someone else. But I want us to look closer at why the two primary people groups in Jesus' day rejected him. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1.23, when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. Next blank on your notes. The Romans rejected Jesus because they didn't like God's children. The Romans rejected Jesus because they didn't like God's children. The Romans, the, the Gentiles... They never gave Jesus a chance 
because they so hated the Jews. In Jesus' day, Roman soldiers were stationed all over Palestine. They didn't want to be there. They, they wanted to be home with their families. And the Jews were very proud. They hated being under Roman occupation. There was racial hatred, all kinds of violence between these two groups. Jewish extremists would walk through the crowd in a crowded streets. They'd have a hidden knife. If a Roman soldier would come by, they would stab that Roman soldier. Then they'd disappear into the crowd. Every now and then, the Jews would start a rebellion. It would quickly be stopped. And the Romans would crucify dozens, sometimes even hundreds of Jews. The Romans hated the Jews and saw them as inferior. They hated, they rejected the children of God, so they weren't open to the Son of God. They never gave Jesus a chance. Some people never really give Jesus a chance. They never really consider church or faith because they don't like Christians. They don't like the children of God, so they reject the Son of God. I heard about a man, a deacon in his church. He served faithfully. He gave sacrificially of his time and his money. One day his preacher was charged with embezzling money from the church, and this church deacon said, I have not prayed since. Another guy said, I got a divorce, and my church wouldn't remarry me. Later, I found out the preacher who would not remarry me was having an affair at the same time. Other people say, well, my stepdad, he, he pretended to be such a good Christian, but he was so abusive at home, it, it really turned me off. Or when I was a teenager, our preacher ran off with the piano player and I want no part of church ever again. Now, Christians do need to be on guard, and we need to rid our lives of hypocrisy. We're told in James 1, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. And look at 1 Peter 2, verse 12. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. Some people have written off the whole thing because they don't like God's children. But just because someone plays Mozart badly doesn't mean Mozart was a bad composer. Just because some people follow Jesus badly doesn't mean Jesus isn't worth following. And we all need to remember what Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. Christians are not perfect. We're not even close. Truth is, Christians can be hypocritical. The truth is, Christians can be self-righteous. The truth is, Christians can be annoying and weird at times. But don't let us get in the way of seeing the perfect gift God sent at Christmas, His only Son, Jesus. It's what happened to the Romans. They, they wouldn't give Jesus a chance because they linked Him with the children of God. So they wrote Him off as the Son of God. Now, the other group, the one John is mainly talking about in John chapter 1, is, of course, the Jews. John 1, verse 11, he came to his own people, and even they rejected him. Next blank on your notes. The Jews rejected Jesus because he wasn't the kind of Messiah they expected. The Jews rejected Jesus because he wasn't the kind of Messiah they expected. They had this idea about what the Messiah would do. 
They thought the Messiah would come and establish a kingdom on earth and they would be political leaders in his kingdom. They thought they'd finally be out from under Roman rule. They wouldn't be under Roman captivity ever again. The Messiah would save them from the Romans. It is what they were expecting. In John chapter 12, we read about Jesus coming to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday in what we call the triumphal entry. John 12, 12 to 15. The news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, Don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. It looks like a coronation, doesn't it? And it seems like Jesus is going to be the kind of king the Jews expected. The Jews love it. Maybe he is the Messiah. But... We know the rest of the story, don't we? Jesus is soon arrested. He's beaten. He's on trial. None of it matches up with what the Jews thought about the Messiah. So many of these Jews who were yelling, Hail Jesus on Palm Sunday, they're yelling, Nail Jesus, crucify him on Good Friday. God wasn't working the way they expected. Things weren't going the way they thought they should. So they turn on Jesus. It still happens today. People grow up in the church. They have real faith. They believe in Jesus. But then life doesn't turn out the way they thought. So they walk away from Jesus. They they, they walk away from Jesus Because he hasn't saved them the way they think he should save them. He hasn't been the kind of Messiah they thought he would be. Some people reject Jesus because he doesn't seem to be the kind of Savior they were hoping for. What kind of Savior doesn't save from cancer? What kind of Savior doesn't save from foreclosure? What kind of Savior doesn't save a marriage? What kind of Savior doesn't save a child? What the Jews didn't understand and what we tend to forget at times, Jesus came to save, but he didn't come to save us from the Romans. He came to save us from hell. Jesus says in John 16, 33, here on earth, You will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Jesus' main purpose, the main reason he came, wasn't to save us from temporary struggles. He came to save us from our sins and to save us from hell. The angel says this about Mary, Matthew 1, 21. She will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Hebrews 7, verse 25, He, Jesus, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. When Jesus was being beaten, when he's on the cross, the Jews say, this isn't what we want in a Messiah. When God doesn't work the way we think he should work, When he doesn't meet our expectations, many people walk away. You know, when I read in the Bible about the first Christmas, I always think about Joseph, Jesus' earthly father. I think Joseph must have felt God wasn't doing things the way he expected because Joseph's life was constant stress constant chaos when Jesus was born. Did you ever think about that? Uh, First, there was his strained relationship with Mary. Then there was this notice of extra taxes due. Everybody hates that. Then a stressful trip to Bethlehem when Mary's nine months pregnant. Then no room for them in the inn. 
And Joseph has to help her give birth in a barn. And then soon after Jesus is born, look at what we read in Matthew 2.13. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Jo Joseph's situation wasn't even close to perfect. Max Licato wrote an imaginary prayer of Joseph outside the stable. This isn't the way I planned it, God, not at all. My child being born in a stable? This isn't the way I thought it would be, a cave with sheep and donkeys, hay and straw. This, this isn't at all what I imagined. I imagined family, grandmothers, neighbors, friends standing by my side. I imagined the house erupting with the first cry of an infant. Slaps on the back, loud laughter, jubilation. That's how I thought it would be. It just doesn't seem right. What kind of husband am I? I provide no midwife to aid my wife, no bed to rest her back. Her pillow is a blanket off my donkey. My house for her is a shed with hay and straw. The smell is bad, the, the animals are loud. Did I miss something, God? This is not the way I wanted it to be. This is not the way I wanted my son. Oh my, I, I did it again. I, I did it again, didn't I, Father? I, I, I don't mean to do that. It's just that I forget. He's not my son. He's yours. The child is yours. The plan is yours. The idea is yours. And forgive me for asking, but is this how God enters the world? Max Licato. Now, I don't know. Maybe, maybe Joseph never really prayed a prayer like that. But I'm sure you have. Now, you didn't pray it standing outside a stable, but standing outside an emergency room or inside a courtroom or standing beside a grave. We've all asked questions about why things happen the way they do. Why is there so much stress? Why is there so much pain, so many problems in life? But we read in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all you do, and He will show you which path to take. When things don't make sense, when life isn't going like you expected, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Keep seeking his will in all you do. Romans 8, 38 and 39. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now notice, God doesn't say don't worry about the future because nothing bad's ever going to happen to you. No, he says whatever happens in the future, I will be with you. My love will be with you, so don't be afraid. Once upon a time, there was a wealthy and powerful king who wanted more than anything to be loved and to love. He fell in love with a very simple, poor peasant woman. Why he should love her is hard to figure out, but he loved her and knew he could not face the future without her. So one day, this king rose from his throne, laid aside his scepter, took off his crown and his royal robes. He left the palace and lived in the streets. He scratched out a living, begged for food. The king became as ragged as the one he loved. It was the only way. It was the only way. 
How does the story end? Does she receive him? Does she reject him? Well, I'd like to think it has one of those happily ever after endings. I'd like to think she was won over by the king's amazing love. I'd like to think that it ends with the two of them spending the rest of their days together. How could she resist such amazing, wonderful love? 1 John 4, verse 10. This is real love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. John 1, verse 14. The word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. If you want to accept God's perfect Christmas gift and give your life to Jesus, he wants you just as you are. Set in a front row pew after this service ends, we will help as you confess Jesus and as you're baptized into Jesus. Some of you have done that before coming to Central. You're thinking about making Central your church home. Sit in a front pew after this service. We'll talk with you about that decision. Let's pray, folks. Father in heaven, we praise you because King Jesus left his throne in heaven and he came to live among us because he loves us. Thank you for Jesus, the perfect Christmas gift. And Father... Please open my eyes, open our eyes to one person who needs your love today and give me, give us the courage to share it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we sing this next song, I invite you to the steps of the stage to pray. You can come and pray about anything on your heart. Come and thank God for blessings or bring your needs to him. Psalm 145, verses 18 and 19 says, The Lord is close to all who call on Him. Yes, to all who call on Him in truth. He grants the desires of those who fear Him. He hears their cries for help and rescues them. We know trouble doesn't go away just because it's Christmas time. Pain, whether it's physical or emotional, I think it's usually worse at Christmas because other people always seem so happy. Your, your cancer, your disease, your, your grief, your loneliness seem worse in contrast. I invite you, come and pray about your pain, about health needs, relationship needs, financial needs. Come and pray for someone else. Pray for someone who doesn't know Jesus. Pray God would use you to share his love with them. Pray God would help you invite them to Central this Christmas. Let's stand up, let's sing, let's pray. Oh!
praying, God. We thank you for your power. We thank you that you still do miracles today. Thank you that we can celebrate that this Christmas season and the hope that we find in you. Help us to live lives that tell other people that we've accepted your gift of salvation, your gift of hope. We love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Come on, everybody says amen and amen. Thank you guys for being here uh, this morning for worship. We'd love to see you right back here tonight for Jingle Jam. That starts at 6 o'clock. Uh, it's just a fantastic family worship event, uh, Christmas show. So why don't you come back tonight? Otherwise, we'll see you right here next weekend. God bless you guys.